Hi Psych 100 students, this is Dr. Balhan, and we're going to continue our discussion of brain structures, moving on to the forebrain. The forebrain houses structures that are in charge of functions that we typically consider very human. And many of these functions take place in the cerebral cortex. This is the gray covering to our brain that is all wrinkly, and it's so wrinkly because we have very, very large cortices that control some very complicated and complex behaviors. And our brain has to keep growing beyond the size of our skull, and the solution that it came up with was to wrinkle and fold in on itself. This cerebral cortex is really the control center for a lot of our behaviors, our thoughts, and our emotions, and it can be divided into four lobes. The first lobe is the frontal lobe, and if you were to put your hand on your forehead to take your temperature right now, your hand would be hovering over your frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the youngest parts of our brain. For all of us, it's not fully developed until about 25 years. And the frontal lobe was also the youngest part of the brain in terms of evolution, so it's been the most recent part of the brain to evolve. The frontal lobe has the ability to help us with speech and planning. So this is decision making. This is analyzing information. This is inhibiting some responses. There's also a portion of the frontal lobe that's devoted to motor movement. And this is where we do initiate and plan for movement. Our personality is also housed in our frontal lobe. And we know about this through a case study of a man named Phineas Gage. Your textbook talks more about Phineas Gage, and you can find some good videos about him on YouTube. I highly suggest the one where Alan Alda is the narrator. Moving on from the frontal lobes, another lobe in the forebrain is called the parietal lobe. And this is on the top, more rear portion of your brain. The parietal lobe does many things. One of these is to allow us to understand or process sensory information. So we learned that the, the thalamus receives sensory information and some of that is going to be sent to the primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe. I'm going to look more closely at both the motor and the sensory cortex. So in this diagram, the red is the motor cortex. The blue on the right side is the parietal lobe with the somatosensory cortex. And then there's a funny looking human. And that figure is meant to depict how much brain matter is devoted to each body part. So if the body part looks really, really big, that means that there are more neurons and more brain matter devoted to either moving that body part or feeling and sensing for that body part. So looking at the red slice there, we see that the tongue, the lips, the hands and fingers, those are all represented very large, which means that we have more fine motor control over those parts of our body. Whereas if you look at the knee, that's quite small, the trunk also quite small, and that's because we don't have that much fine motor movement or really a big range of movement in those body parts. Now looking over to the sensory cortex, the blue part on the right side, you can interpret the diagram in the same way. Those body parts that are represented very large are more sensitive. So things like our tongue, our lips, our face, our fingers and hands, again, that has a lot of sensation. Whereas our trunk, our hip, not so sensitive. Another thing to know about the entire brain is that it is contralaterally controlled. And what that means is that the right side of the brain controls the left side of our body. And the left side of our brain controls the right side of our body. So in this picture, the left motor cortex, when it is active, it will be sending signals to move parts of our body on the right side. So our right hand or our right knee. And this section of the sensory cortex is also from the left side of the brain so that will help us to detect touch on the right side of our bodies. Two more lobes make up the forebrain. 
The third one is the occipital lobe, and this is located at the back of your brain. And here is housed the primary visual cortex. This is where we process visual information. This is where our brain sees. Some of us are familiar with concussions, either academically or experientially. And we may know that when people have concussions, sometimes they have some visual disturbances. They might red out or black out. So see red, see black. They might see fuzzy. They might have some shaking, jarring vision. And the reason for this is because when concussion happens, your brain shakes a bit in your skull. And that can shear neurons, so it can damage parts of your brain. One common type of concussion is a front-to-back concussion, where the brain will uh, shake, let's say, from front to back. So when the back part of the shake happens, that's the occipital lobe uh, coming up against the skull. And so there could be some damage to the occipital lobe and the primary visual cortex, which is going to cause some visual uh, impairment. The fourth lobe is our temporal lobe, and this is located on the side of the brain. And here is housed the primary auditory cortex. So this is the part of our brain that is devoted to processing our sound information. It lets us hear. And thus far, we've looked at the hindbrain, what keeps us alive, and the forebrain, what really makes us human and lets us do some of those more complex interconnected kind, kinds of functions.